But here's what we're going to do. We're going to open up that architecture model and really think about how we can transfer it into Navis Works and start doing the coordination with it. If you do an open on it, and you go on out to that Dropbox or that kind of uh, archive that we gave you, let me see if I can find it on my machine. It is kind of over there. I put it in my Dropbox, but we'll see where it is on yours. And now oh, where did it go? Actually, what I should do is just unzip that thing. Oh, I know where it is. Hang on. Let me do it the other way. It's also in your Penn State folder. So let me go and do that thing. Schools, Penn State, 3D coordination review. And you should find, let's go to, um, hmm, which one I want to go to? I'm going to go out, I'm going to pull on out. Go to the one, do you have one that says um, BIM collaboration? Let's pull it out of there and we'll go to leaf models and go to the mixed use architecture. Okay, so we should be in that set of circles. You have one that says like a PSC BIM coordination? Okay, go after that and let's get the architecture model as a starting point. Yes. Oh, okay. What you need to do is, if you have the archive of folders, and if you have that archive, let's see where I can find this. I go up here, and what's going to happen is, inside that archive, you should have three folders. One that says 4D simulation, one that says 3D coordination review. Do you have one that says BIM collaboration too? Also? No, you don't have that one. Hmm, okay. What do I need to do then? I've sort of messed up in terms of what's available to you. Hmm. What do I want to do in terms of that? And we don't have access to Beehive, we know that, right? Because we don't have access to that. <laughs> Let's do this. How about for this first part, just walks along a little bit. I'm going to show you how you transfer it over to Revit. We're going to pick up a project that's already been transferred, and we can work with that to do in the flash protection. So for this first piece, just kind of watch, and we'll get things ready, and then we'll go from there. Okay, so I basically have this file. It is just our architectural model. I want to go ahead and transfer this over to Navisworks. Okay, and in terms of transferring over to Navisworks, it's actually pretty easy. What I need to do is just basically set up a 3D view that has all the different elements that I want to bring across. Okay, that part's pretty easy. Most of you who work with Reddit can do that pretty nicely. So we'll go through, we'll set up a 3D view. We'll say that I want to go through and like uh, transfer it. What I tend to often do is, if I have a view set up that has all the different elements visible that I want to include, I'll actually create a name view so I can return to this really easily and get back to it. So, for example, I have this default PD view. I'll often create one where I duplicate it. And we will say that, oh, this is going to be called. I'll just transfer to Navisworks. The only reason I like to do that is that uh, it's always nice to have one to go back to that I'm sure to grab all the elements. Because if you've done anything in your view and you've done visibility graphics and turn things off and you have a section box that's flipping things out, okay, those things won't come unless you see the entire model. So go through and do something like that. What we're going to have you next is actually just go to, it's under the um, audience tab, and there'll be an external tool if it's installed on your machine. Okay, where we can export things to Navisworks. Now, a lot of these machines I don't think have Navisworks installed on them yet. Okay, so you're not going to see that inside this office. It's important to do the If it's been installed, if Navisworks has been installed on your machine after it was installed, you'll have this thing available. So you have this exporter that'll let you go ahead and take things out into an MWC format. Okay, now, if that's not installed on your machine, or you've installed Navisworks and it didn't somehow end up in Revit, not to worry, you can get it to show up in there. This is kind of more of a Windows trick than anything in terms of making things happen. If you go out to your control panel and you go to the part where you install and add programs, if you go over to our programs, and I'll go to programs and features, you actually find somewhere buried alive in that list. The Navisworks exporter plugins. Oh, they are right. Oops, they stopped moving. Okay. If you go through and choose those exporter plugins and you double click on that, 
It'll actually go through and take you through an install dialog where you can choose that you'd like to go through and install those plugins into some other programs. So, for example, if I add any new features, it'll take you back to the whole list where you can see, oh, let's put in the exporter for AutoCAD, let's put in the exporter for uh, ARCHICAD or MicroStation or 3ds Max, whatever it is. You can install more plugins to have it sort of put in just built into some more products. But that's only if you don't have it already in there. It just really makes it a little bit easier to bring it that way. But I'll just say, go ahead and say cancel this right now because I already have it installed. Okay, and then we'll go back over to Revit and take a look. Let me open that thing back up again. Okay, the only other thing I'll talk about being that you might want to do in preparation. <coughs> Interesting. My 3D surface is getting a fourth ring here. Hang on. What's going on? Okay, there you go. Is it sometimes helps to give yourself a little bit of like a registration handle to kind of get things together. Because if you have your architectural model, someone else has a structural model, and you're trying to get all those things to link up with each other, you'd like to get it all to link up by the grids and the levels and things like that. Those are really good. The sad thing is, Grids aren't considered to be a real object, so they don't come across in the Navisworks automatically. Okay. What you can do, though, just to really help yourself is, go to one of your floor plan views. Okay. And I got the grid there. What I want to do is actually put in a 3D object that will sort of be the equivalent of the grids, and that will just give me something to sort of hang on to and try to register things together. So. How I can do that is if I come on over to and oh, it's just a model line. A model line is a 3D line that's going to hang around inside your model and actually do get transferred. I can come over and I can even sort of pick. Let me just pick that grid line and I'll pick this grid line. And what am I doing? I'm just putting in a 3D handle that I can grab and then when I do that in several different models, I can move that to align the different models since the grid lines didn't come across. That make sense? That's all I'm trying to do is give myself a little registration mark. Okay. Once I've done that, let's go over to the um, add-ins. And I will go through and... Where am I? I'm modeling and placing lines. Modifying and placing lines. I'll just go out of there. Stop that. I'll go back over to add-ins. I'll say that I want to go through and export that. Now this works. If I go through and say I want to export that, you can take it to an NWC format, the NWC being that cache format. Give it a location where you want to go through and save that. So I'm going to do my um, NWC transfer architecture. Say save it. Actually, let me not do it from this view. In the floor plan view, I would only go ahead and get the first four elements. Okay, that's why I tried to do that thing. Oh, I didn't even kind of say it. Once. Hmm. I might have two copies of things open. Let me do it from this view. Again, external tools, Navisworks, a MWC transfer, architectural. Save that away. What it's going to do, it's going to carefully go through that model find all 1,402 elements and write them out in a common file format that Navisworks could understand. Okay. Now we do the same thing, I won't do it the same for everybody, but you do the same thing in the structural model, we do the same thing in your MEP model, but always going through and adding that little bit of registration so you can go ahead and like line things up and then kind of bring them on in Navisworks and have them line up with each other. Okay. And that's the story we prep them, we prep everything out by exporting it in an MWC format. Okay. If you have installed the exporter from MicroStation or something like that, you can export it directly to an MWC format. Navisworks will often need the default format too. So if you just have a DWG file or a file from Tecla, whatever it's coming from, you can bring those in here too, but in the native formats. Okay. Navisworks is like a can opener. It just sort of gets into everything. Okay. I will go ahead and show the export from the structural side, since uh, you guys can't do that. Let's just go into Navisworks and we'll look at what are the data sets that you have and see if we can make this work. So I'm going to exit out of Revit. And no, I won't save the changes right now. 
But what we will do is go into Navisworks, and let's see, on a, let's, but you don't have Navisworks on your machine. Well, this is really a happy little demo in terms of making things happen. Please, watch along as we uh, like try to keep you entertained with this stuff, but it's, uh, nah, this is rough. Uh, I wish you can sort of experience it yourself, but it's actually a pretty good show, too. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's open Navisworks and show you what it looks like. Ordered by technology again. The story of my life. I think it's opening. There we go. And Atlasworks is really all about bringing in all these interdisciplinary files from a lot of different disciplines and pairing them together. And again, one of the strengths of Navisworks is this may be the first time you actually have a chance to get all the different file formats together because if everyone worked in Revit, it would be easy to bring them all into Revit, but a lot of people aren't working in Revit, so if you have people working in these other file formats, this is really your first chance to really get them together in 3D space and sort of see what's coordinating with not coordinating so well. So let's let this finish opening up. And what we're going to do is we'll actually go out and bring in some NWC files that we got out of other sources, okay, and kind of intersect them together and see how the clash detection works. Okay, now just to sort of contrast this, if we were working just in and working with the files, we could go ahead and just do something called interference checking within there. Okay, and that works for two different Revit files. The big limitation, though, is it only works sort of pairwise. You can only sort of intersect two different things. Now this works actually lets us intersect a lot of different things simultaneously. We kind of bring them all together. So here's now this works. There's not really a whole lot going on. Well, it looks like it's flashing at me. Let me see what it wants. Looks like I actually have a couple different versions of it open. That's not very happy. So I got impatient. Let me see if I can kind of kill one of them. It looks like it's still trying. It was just trying so hard. Oh, there we go. I'm making my life difficult today. Oh, great. So now we got rid of both of them. Okay. And we put out of this and just kind of free up some memory and we'll do this slowly. Slowly but surely. I should copy that over there. Again, we'll open that as let's manage. I'll come down now and kind of do this in a very systematic and organized way because somehow like, being frantic isn't working very well for me. So we'll do it this other way instead. Okay, we'll see if that comes up. It takes a little bit to open. This is a big program. We'll see how it works. There it comes. Again, it'll open up. It'll give us a window. And here's what we're going to do inside Navisworks. We're going to go through and we're going to grab the first file. It doesn't really matter which one uses the first file. We will kind of open that one and make it our master. It doesn't really matter. It's just sort of one. Then we're going to append in all the other files and try to like interleave them so they're all on top of each other. Okay. I'm in Navisworks. It seems like it's happy. Let's go ahead and start. Actually, this is interesting. I think in the latest version, everything just an append. We'll try that. We'll say that we're going to append some things. So what are we going to append? Let's start this. Actually, you can't start this because you don't have Navisworks, so I'll just show you how it works. I'll go out to the Dropbox, and we'll go to um, that folder the Penn State folder. I'm going to find this again. Education. We go out to my Penn State folder. Schools, Penn State. I'm going to go through my 3D coordination review. I'm going to go to the Audubon Center project. And I'm going to choose first the architectural model. So I'm going to grab the NWC file for that and kind of hear the Audubon Center. It's actually a project, kind of a very sustainable project that we feature in a lot of different things. But we have for the architectural model, and that's kind of the starting point for what we're looking at. You can look at the architectural model. You can sort of expand the tree. And so I select anything. I can select the first floor. I can select things that are in this varying level. Anything I want to go through and select, I can go through here. See, it's on level 11. There's an exterior brick in it, but anything I go through and choose over here is all the things that have no odd levels to them. 
so gutters and downspouts and whatever it is I can go through and kind of take a look at. So we can go through and kind of just look at individual models and all the different elements. What's happening in here is like here's all these exterior walls and things like that. You can kind of take a look at how the geometry is defined. We can also go through and take a look at the properties. So for example, oh, we can look at the properties of any sort of the specific element here. And we can look for things based on the family name, for example. If the name is something like corn emollient, you can select that. And we'll basically, anything you go through and pull in here, it'll go through and choose those elements in there. Let me find something that's going to be a little bit better. Yeah, I'm just looking for walls or something. Some curtain wall, single glass. Those big curtain wall doors, you can see them sort of highlighting in blue over there. Let me go ahead and... What I want to do is actually get the steering wheel going. So I can sort of see that. I'm kind of seeing that right now. Okay. Doing too many things here. Let me go through and pull in another model just so we can see how they intersect. I'll append the second model and I'll say append. And this time let me go ahead and grab sort of the structural model. It'll come on in there, and you can see that it actually sort of layered some more information in there underneath. Let me see, oh, I just want so badly to zoom that. Let me say zoom the fifth or something. What's happening is my steering wheel, which I like to be working with, is missing right now. And I'm going to figure out how to get it back in just a second. There's the navigation bar. There we go. So I zoom on in there. You can sort of see that I'm now looking at the foundations underneath the building right now. What's happening is actually two different models open right now. So I can say there's the architectural model, there's the structural model, it's kind of a slab in the foundations underneath it. And I can right click and actually do things like, oh, let me go ahead and just hide that. Or I can unhide that. Or I can actually do the inverse. I could hide the unselected, which will basically only show me the structure that's inside that building as opposed to showing the architecture. So it's really all about selecting different objects and either hiding or unhiding so you can sort of see different things. Let me bring in one more model just so you can sort of take a look at it too. And that is we'll go through and append the MEP model to the whole thing because that's really where we have an awful lot of conflicts typically. Okay, so again within this model, if I go zooming on in, you can see ductwork, you can see ductwork sort of fanning out to different registers. You can see uh, all sorts of sprinklers, different things kind of happening here. So the idea is basically, you pull a lot of information in this model, it's getting to be a little bit complex, such that visually, I may have a hard time seeing what's going on. If I have really good eagle eyes, I can often spot different problems that are happening here, but I might need a little bit of help in terms of identifying those things and help managing those things. So here's what we're going to do in terms of 3D coordination. There's a special tool built into Navisworks that once you get the models in Navisworks, will help you just sort of fill it out and find the different things that are clashing. Okay, it's called Flash Detective. And you'll find it right over here in the tools, in the home palette. And here's how it basically works. You basically choose what it is that you want to intersect with other sites. Okay. And you can do this by just sort of choosing big chunks of the model, so I can say just intersect the entire structural model with an MEP model, and it'll find an awful lot of items. Here I can actually start setting up search sets and selection sets. I get smaller subsets. Maybe I want to see the ductworks versus the beams, and then we're getting a smaller selection set to work with as opposed to getting all of them. But let's kind of show you how it works at a really high level, and we'll talk about how to make it a little bit finer. So at a high level, it works like this. You can choose basically what it is you want to clash. So for example, I'll go ahead and take a look at the structure as what I want to look at on the left side. And I can choose a specific piece of the structure. Okay, or I can just choose the entire structure. Let me try that as a starting point. On the other side, I'm going to choose the entire MEP system. And the MEP model on that side. Okay, then we can start thinking about really what we want to be doing. Okay. There's this notion of a hard uh, clash. A clearance clash and duplicates, and let's talk about that. Hard clashes were two things that are actually physically trying to occupy the same amount of space. Okay, now, sometimes that's a bad thing when a duct is going right through the middle of a beam, that's typically a bad thing. 
Sometimes it's an okay thing because the way we model things isn't always 100% clean. Sometimes we actually sort of have the beam or the, the columns in the middle of the walls, and we don't worry about the fact that they clash because it's an awful lot of work to model everything in great detail to kind of eliminate every last clash. In fact, when we start looking at stairs and rails and how they all connect together, things do touch each other in an intersect. So not every clash is necessarily a bad thing. You have to figure out sort of which ones you care about and which ones you don't care about. Okay? But we can use a hard clash to really go through and figure out anything that's actually physically touching. What it's doing here is giving us a tolerance so we can go ahead and sort of say that you know, what's allowable, like, you know, how close the uh, connection actually has to be. And 0.025 meters is actually uh, pretty close. Let's see what that one is. Not really what I learned for right now. Okay. If we go through and start, it will help us find all these different things, but let me kind of talk about the other types of clashes first. There's a clearance clash. A clearance clash is, hey, I'm not actually touching, but just because of the way I need a certain amount of clearance around an object, I want to know if anything is within a foot or two feet or six inches or whatever the required clearance is. So, for example, just as you're putting piping in relative to ductwork or something like that, you may want to allow a certain amount of clearance either because you're worried about some sort of uh, you know, like a burning or some sort of uh, heat problem. You might want to leave yourself a certain amount of clearance just because for installation you actually want to have a little bit of clearance to make sure that you know, the fact that it actually is more than like, you know, five thousandths of an inch away may not be enough for what you really want to try and do. So that's what a clearance clash is. The final one is a duplicates clash. And a duplicates clash, that actually just helps you when you have two objects that are right on top of a column in, the structural engineer put a column in, they're actually duplicates that are right on top of each other. And we ultimately want to figure out if they are there so we can figure out which one to eliminate ultimately and kind of like uh, take care of any redundancies that are in there, because we don't want to estimate those twice. But let me choose a hard clearance. Okay. We will now go ahead and say start. It's going to go ahead and look for clashes. Let's see what it found. It actually found 657 things that are things of clashes right now, which again, is a lot more clash than you think we own, which is, written in, is really valid. But we'll go ahead and like start with that as a starting point and work from there. What we can do is go to something called the results window, okay, and it will show us each of those clashes, and let's kind of think about how we can actually look at them. What it will show us in this window is down here at the bottom, and we'll kind of talk about what it is that's clashing. It will show us the different elements that are over here. We can have them highlighted in the model, and the way this sort of works is we can choose, oh, whether to reveal it, whether to kind of transition to it, whether to dim the other things, whatever we do, we can hide other objects so we're only looking at specifically the items that are getting the clash. But we can start going down through this list and just choosing clashes. And what we'll do is actually take us to something. Let's kind of back on out there and see what that one is. Zoom. I'm doing it without my mouse. Okay, so there we have, it looks like we have some sort of pipe that's coming up through like a floor slab or something like that. That may or may not be sort of a valid clash. What we typically do is, in a big BIM cave meeting, or maybe with like a BIM coordinator who's working to prep things for the BIM cave meeting, still can filter these and still can kind of get that down to a valid number of clashes that actually need to have several different consultants look at and how to resolve that. And we can start to classify those clashes. We can say that that clash is active, it's been reviewed, it's been approved, it's been resolved. You can start to store information about that clash and really start tracking the clashes of the database, which is really something you want to do because we want to tag things that are sort of valid clashes, we want to assign them to different people, okay, and then have people go on back, make the appropriate changes, and come on back and uh, make sure those clashes got resolved. Okay. So you can, on any of these different things, say, okay, that's an active flash. Now we're going to like, take care of it. That actually is sort of the issue I want to keep going with. Let me see about, oh, I double click that. I'm trying to see about actually putting some more information about the flash. Let's come on down, take a look at what's going on in here. It's actually even sort of reporting what the type of flash is, what the distance is. You'll also see there's this whole notion of who it's designed to. So what do I have going on here? And my very squishy window is basically telling me that there's some sort of pile cap that's intersecting with 
some PVC piece of piping, so that may be a problem. So I'll go ahead and say that's an active flash also that needs some sort of review. Okay, I'm going to assign it. Let me see if I can come in there. Let me try this in terms of right click and see if I can do it that way. I had a comment, I'll assign it. Let's go ahead and assign that to Glenn because he needs to go ahead and take a look at that. And whatever I might sort of suggest is some note for him when he's taking a look at that. So I can produce a report for what he's seeing. I can also sort of basically say whether it's been approved and who it was approved by because we really want kind of a nice status record and a little uh, track history of what's happening to all these things so we have some accountability for whether these things are okay or not okay. And we can kind of keep on going and let's go have another clash. Finding different things that what do we have going on here. This looks like we have a piece of pipe and we have a piece of uh, like a W12 by 26, which is sort of hitting some uh, short radius uh, kind of pipe. You know, as we go through and look at these, and again, I'll say that's sort of an active flash that we want to take a look at. We can assign that to someone. Okay. One of the key things that we get into here is the tool is really only going to find the problems for you. It's not going to resolve the problems for you. So a big piece of the art of doing then coordination is figuring out whose problem is that and what's the best way to go through and resolve that. That's often what we do in our big cave coordination meetings is, okay, I can move the pipe, you know, you can go ahead and move the piece of structure, start thinking about what's going to be, uh, what has the, the most degrees of freedom, what's going to create the fewest problems downstream, maybe be the least cost way of doing it. But it really is kind of an issue of sort of just identifying things and figuring out who it should be assigned to. And I'll go ahead and assign that to the plumber, for example. Now, a really kind of cool feature that's available in this, okay, we can go ahead and report these out, but a cool feature that's available now is this thing called switchback. And let's just kind of talk about what that's about. Now, for this model, I don't have the original Revit models. I only have these MWC files, so I can't actually edit the original Revit model. Okay. But if I have the original Revit model, I can take this clash and say, switch back. What that will do is it will take me back to the original structural model and highlight that element right in the structural model so I can make the change right now. Okay. And then in the other structure, I can say switch back and it'll take me right back into Navisworks where I left off. And this is a workflow that's a convenient way of actually resolving issues right on the spot because it turns out just finding this element in your structure model that's played in the conflict could be sort of a hard thing. So if you have the other and you have the access to the original models, this whole switchback feature is a really great way of just going out, grabbing what you need, and kind of pulling it back in. But what the more common thing to do is to sort of go ahead and identify the things that you want. We can go ahead and produce a report, sort of choosing the types of fields we want. Maybe I'll put the assigned to field in there also. I can decide whether I want to go through and include some sort of pictures and decide what format I want, whether I want it as an XML, as a tabular report or just as an HTML report, let me just see the HTML format. I'm going to say write the reports. Okay, and all this is my flash report at HTML. Save that away. Okay. I probably want to go ahead and do a little bit of filtering here, so I'm not showing everything, but this is going to basically report create a giant HTML report with a list all the different clashes, which the elements there that involve, who it got assigned to, and show you a picture of the clash. Okay, so let then let it do that thing. Which I see the air handler, which is right there, which is where that's a completely like uh, some piece of structure going right through it. That's not looking very good. Okay, and within that, then I can go back out to you. Let me see if I can go out to my documents. Let me see if I can find that thing. There it is. So this will basically just report all the different clashes and saying where they are, showing pictures of each of them. We've got an awful lot of them here. Okay, so that's why there's like so much going on in terms of all this type of stuff. And we can then use this to try to identify those things and knocking them off one at a time. So the whole issue of basically choosing over here, choosing over here, identifying as a clash, that's pretty easy. And even going through and then identifying and assigning individual people, that's not too hard either. Where the real art comes into this, and what you got to sort of think about in terms of working with Navisworks is just really 
All you go ahead and set up, whether it is you're going to go ahead and try to clash. Because just clashing an entire structure against an entire MEP system producing 600 uh, clashes is probably a little bit more than anyone wants to handle at a single sitting. Okay. So it's actually much, much better to go through and set up selection sets and set up search criteria so that we go for a specific thing. Let me get just the joists versus the duct work and see how those work and resolve those issues. Let me get just the columns versus something else and kind of keep on doing it in subsets. And it really becomes much more manageable that way. So as a high level, what I want to do with this is that it does a pretty good job. It's great at finding the clashes, but really what your job is is in defining those kind of search criteria and how that works. And how you set up things like that is, well, we can go ahead and set up batches of things so we can repeat these. We'd like to repeat the same sort of text every time we come back into it. But if I come back out and I close flash detector and I come through here, I can do selections. Let me go through and put up the selection tree. I can select things by, for example, like, this looks like a whole lot of different, this looks like a bunch of HSS sections. Yeah. I can go ahead and select them over here manually and grab a whole bunch of those. I'm trying to get all those. Sure, there we go. Okay, there's all those tube steel sections. It's interesting right on the foundation plan layer, but that's where they are right now. Let me zoom on out here again. Okay, there's all those tube steel columns. I can go through and so select them manually and create a set. Well, what I want to do is, having selected those, I can add those to a set. And what I do is I'll call those the tube steel columns. But even better, let's talk about doing it this way. Selection sets are okay. The problem with selection sets is it's only selecting those things that I just explicitly selected right there, those items. Okay. So the problem is, if I go through and I keep on changing my model, I go through and add some more columns in the next release or move them around, okay, it may not select them because there might be more, there might be less, something might have changed. So a much, much better way than creating a selection set is to do this. Go ahead and find items, okay, and as opposed to doing them this way, let's go ahead and try to, based on the criteria, and this always takes me a little bit of time because it's sort of hard to navigate this way. Family name, that's probably about right. Contains. And you see some of the different values that are available in there. Ah, HSS, I think I see them. So let me find all those. That just grabbed a whole bunch of them. Okay. Having grabbed this one, I can now come over here at this set and come over here and say, oh, oh it's a selection set. Do I do? Add current search. Okay. Those are like my HSS hollow steel. Okay. What did I just do there? Then I actually save the search criteria. Now that's actually much more powerful than saving explicit selection because what's going to happen is when I go back, you know, for that update, you know, at the model, it's just. Sure. Actually, let's try. Let us try that in terms of what's going on. Actually, this whole thing is a couple different ways. Let's do this. We can, like, um, for example, we have that selection set. Let's try this. Let me try this where we say, uh, make them visible, not that. That's just kind of doing it that way. Let me do it this way. Let me come over to the properties. And I think over here in the names, family names, family type, name. <laughs> So you can grab them there, there is a selection set. You can go ahead and say, basically, um, I the unselected. You kind of get them that way. Actually, that was sort of a bad choice because that's a... Make them 
making bad choices now because I think I just double hid something. Okay, there they are again. In terms of them. You can use the selection sets to try and filter on down in terms of what's going on in the list and select them that way. Now, not so much in what I'll call like a quantity takeoff way, but you can go ahead and create a list of those different things. So, and then where that gets to be useful for you is over here in Clash Detector, okay, as you're going through and trying to select things, you've got too many things going on over here. Okay. I not only have the ability to go ahead and do the things out of um, that window, but I can go through and choose a set. Okay, now I can say, let's just get those hollow steel columns and reset them against the mechanical system. Run that report instead, and we'll see how that only created 25 clashes, which might be a whole lot easier to navigate in terms of what's going on. So, where is the art in this? The art in that is where some flash detector is actually in setting up good selection sets. Because if you set up good selection sets and good filtered sets, it gets a whole lot easier to control what it is you're trying to clash with other things. And it's hard to be smart because the whole structure against the whole MVP system is really kind of gross and we give you too much information. You got to think about what are the things that you're really looking for and target them. Okay? So at a real high level and in the time you have available, that's really the lesson behind flash detection in terms of what's going on with Navisquid. So, any questions about that? Going up? Okay. How about let's let you go now and like, yeah, practice it. Just kind of mess around with that stuff. What's going to happen? We're going to be around in lab tomorrow afternoon. Okay, we're around all day Friday and most of the day Saturday in terms of available. So, if you have questions and some problems you're having and trying to apply this to your specific projects, let me know. And we're like trying to like set up a specific time to meet with you. I think we're set up to meet with most of the groups tomorrow afternoon, right? And then we're, we're, we're set up tomorrow afternoon to uh, meet with most It's a different group. Okay. I'm totally confused about which group. If anyone has something that they need and they want to talk about a project, just send me an email. So, right? So let's go ahead and for our clash detective folks, let's take the break right there. And then like if you want to stick around and kind of talk about 4D simulation, we'll continue that. <laughs>